to another wonderful edutainment edition of the Artemis Presents We All Be News and Radio. I'm your host for the Empowerment Segment, Brother Ron, also known as R2C2H2, the Artemis. And we've got a great one today, a very special one, a very important one. Today's topic is Malcolm X, the OAAU, which is the Organization of African American Unity, or I believe it was the organization of Afro American Unity, which is this year marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of that great organization by the late great Malcolm X. Uh, it was founded this past, uh, it's June 28, 1964, I believe. And also, we'll be talking about Ferguson and what happened with the Eric Gardner situation. We got a very uh, exceptional uh, human, Q H U E. Men being on the phone with us today, who knows a little bit about Brother Malcolm and his last campaign to liberate black folk throughout the diaspora. But if you want to join this conversation, please feel free to call in. Eric code 646 652 4593. Once again, call in. Eric code 646 652 4593. Or if you scurry, you're on the air. We're going to open up the chat room, so feel free to type your questions, comments, and um, thoughts into the chat room, and we might read it to our guests, and uh, who knows. So we're going to move on. Like I said, we already said today's topic, and the guest we got is the Honorable Brother A. Peter Bailey. Uh, we're going to give a little short bio. This guy is a very accessible dude. Uh, the Honorable Brother A. Peter Bailey worked closely with Malcolm X during the last 14 months of his life on his organization of Afro-American Unity, the OAAU uh, movement, and was one of the last five people to speak with him on February 21st, 1965. Currently, he is a communications consultant for the Bethune Du Bois Institute. He is also the playwright of the play Malcolm Martin Megger, the author of Revelations, the autobiography of Alvin Ailey, and co-author of Seven Child, a family memoir of Malcolm X. Without further ado, scholars and laymen, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the one and only, Brother A. Peter Bailey. How are you doing today, sir? Yeah, good afternoon. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, great. Yeah, it's an honor to have you on, man, because you are an exceptional brother, and you stay true to the cause. 50, well, 50 well, years well, later. When you were listening to books, I would just like to also say that I finally uh, have completed my memoir about that experience. It's called Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the Master Teacher. Oh, wow. Uh, and that's, okay, now okay. Available. that's now available also. Uh, right. People can, get a lead, maybe a leader, you can tell them they can get it directly from me. I definitely, I definitely want to let people know how to get in touch with you to get that book. I'm going to give me a copy. I look forward to give me a copy myself. So you told me that. Now, I guess it's very timely to have you on right now because we're looking at, like I said, it was the 50th anniversary of the OAAU, and we're coming up on 2015. We'll mark the uh, 50th anniversary of Malcolm X's assassination, but also the 90th anniversary of his birth. So I'd just like to talk to you about Brother Malcolm and your thoughts about Mr. X, as you know him. Well, I, I think that the, the title of my book basically explains to me what he, what I believe he was to me and to those of us, uh, you know, who were with him at that time, and also what he can be to young people today. He was a master teacher, and I don't think there's any more important member of a community than a master teacher. If you go back and listen to his speeches, and I was fortunate enough to have heard him speak live numerous times, and and he would mention books and magazine articles and and we would run out to try to get those books, managing articles, and try to read them. He gave us a perspective on how to view ourselves, how to view our people, how to view this country, and how to view the world. And uh, that's, that's what a master teacher can do. And when you think about it, brother, there's no more important member of a community than a master teacher. And that's the way I always refer to him, especially when I'm dealing with young people. He taught us. 
And the lessons that he taught us have sustained us uh, uh, to this very day. Wow, what was the most important lesson he taught you? Any lessons stand out from the rest? There were two things that he, that I, uh, that stuck in my mind, I, I learned from him. And it's interesting, well, I, there were many things I learned, but the two things that, that still resonate in my mind, both happened on the very first time I heard him speak live, which is really just fascinating. Uh, it was in June of 1962. I had just moved to Harlem. And, uh, I was walking down Lennox Avenue, which is now called Malcolm X Boulevard, mm-hmm. down, which is Harlem's, you know, one of Harlem's main streets. And I got down to 116th Street and uh, Lennox Avenue with my roommate, and we saw a crowd gathering. We said, what's going on? They said, Malcolm X is going to speak. And at that time, uh, I had heard of him, you know, like vaguely, usually the type of horror stories about how he was a devil. He hated, he called white people devils. He was a, he was a monster. He was a boogeyman. Mm-hmm. I, that was the, that was basically what I had heard about him. So I said to my roommate, let's hear what he's got to say. And so for the next three hours, we stood there in that sun on that June afternoon and listened. And by the time he finished, uh, I was already a Malcolmite. Because yeah. I never heard anyone speak with such clarity and passion and accuracy and forcefulness uh, about the real conditions of race in this country. And two things he said that day that have stayed with me forever. One, he said that uh, contrary to what the traditional civil rights organizations, uh, the impression they gave you, and I don't know whether they did, I don't think they did it at Liberty, but the impression they gave was that if you got rid of a, a George Wallace, or Al- Senator, Governor George Wallace of Alabama, Senator James Eastman of Mississippi, Governor Auburn Harper of Arkansas, you know, and a few other people like that, that everything would be cool. But Malcolm said, no, no. We're not up against white individuals here and there. We're up against a system of white supremacy that is pervasive throughout the entire country. Some in some degrees more so than others, but the but the but the premise, but the but the white supremacy ideology is pervasive throughout this country. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I learned that day, uh, which helped to explain some things for me. Then the second thing he taught us was that I had never heard anyone before talk about as much about the attacks on our minds as he did about the attacks on our bodies. Mm-hmm. And what he said was was that the whole system of white supremacy, one of the things that it has done, and basically that it has been, unfortunately, very effective in, is attacking our minds. And uh, he told us that we have got to be constantly aware, movies, televisions, books, articles, history books, textbooks, everything, things of those types. History books, things of that type, uh, were all designed. To, to 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 give us feelings of inferiority and white feelings of superiority and that we had to be aware of that and be conscious of that, of these attacks on our minds. Now, the physical attacks, despite what we what is currently happening today, the physical manifestations uh, of white supremacy through attacks have been substantially reduced. There's no doubt about that. But the psychological attacks are unrelenting. Mm-hmm. And and unfortunately, most of us are totally unaware that we are actually involved in psychological warfare. Wow. I mean, I knew it. Malcolm's like he was really ahead of the curve. Like you mentioned about the effects of the culture, books, TV, and whatnot. He actually understood and respected the power of the media to influence people's minds. Oh, yeah. Are we missing that piece today? Or do, do we think we um, are missing that understanding? We're completely missing it. We're missing that that music, mm-hmm. uh, literature, television programs, movies, songs. All of these things are designed to get into you and to make you feel or believe certain things. I remember a brother telling me a long time ago, a propagandist that I met who told a group of us, we were young brothers in our 20s, and he told us 
There's no such thing as an innocent movie, innocent book, innocent television program, innocent song. They all have a message. And mm-hmm. you just have to find out what the message is. Mm-hmm. And in many instances, those messages are, uh, you know, are basically psychological attacks on us. And we being, I, have, I used to, I remember when there was a period of time when people that I know didn't want to go to the movies with me because I was sitting there analyzing the movie. And they used to say, why don't you just enjoy the movie? I said, no, 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 no. I want to get the message of what this movie is saying. I want to get the message of coming out of this television program. Mm-hmm. I want to get the message that this song is given out. You know, and, and, and all of, I was open to that kind of lessons from him because of what I had learned from Brother Malcolm. Mm-hmm. If I had met that dude before I met Brother Malcolm, I doubt if I would have paid very much attention to him. Mm-hmm. And when he was teaching us, you know, propaganda analysis. How was, I know you said you heard him first speaking on 125th and, and in 62. What was the first time you actually physically met him, with him eye to eye? No, it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't on 125th. It was okay. on 116th Street. Oh, which gotcha, was, sorry. Which is where Moss Number 7 was. Mm-hmm. He, was, he was speaking outside. There was a big, wide sidewalk there, and he was speaking outside on the sidewalk. It wasn't on 25th Street. Now, the first time I actually met him was in, I think it was January, early January 1964, when uh, he was again to, to uh, talk about founding the OAAU. And I had a friend, and she and I used to talk a lot and have, have lunch together, breakfast together sometimes in Rockefeller Center where we both worked. I worked for Time, Inc. as an editorial reference clerk, and she worked at, uh, at NBC. And so uh, one day she said to me, do you want to be uh, the start of a new organization? And I said, what kind of organization? She said, a black nationalist organization. And I said, yes. I was, I was kind of shocked. I didn't really know that she was, you know, had a black nationalist type attitude despite our conversations. So she said, I'll call you on Saturday morning and tell you where to meet and what time, and don't ask any questions. So I said, okay. She called. I went over to the place where she told us to meet, told me to be. And when I got in there, I saw maybe about 10 or 12 people, including Dr. John Henry Clark, and uh, and the historian, and John Oliver Killings, the author, and a couple other people, though I didn't know, but I had... I recognized, and then it's about five or six people that I didn't and never seen before, and uh, and we were sitting around talking, and then all of a sudden, in walks Brother Malcolm, and it was only when he walked through that door, that I uh, understood that I was going to be a part of an organ finding an organization with Brother Malcolm, and that's he came in, sat down at the table, introduced himself to us, and we introduced ourselves to him. That's when I first met him. That was in I think early January nineteen. 64. Mm, and how was his management style? I mean, was, how was he able to deal with people, I mean, as far as management style? As much what now? His management style, how he deal with people. His was management, he a manager of people? Oh, man, yeah, he, got, he, I mean, he, when you heard him, he's a charismatic person, and, and, you, and he knew how to talk to people on any level, mm. on every level, from the, from the most scholarly Ph.D. types down to the dude, you know, standing on 125th Street. I mean, yeah. he had that ability to speak to people. One, because he was a courteous person. And then most important, this is what I stress, because, you know, I teach sometimes as an adjunct. I've been teaching as an adjunct professor in communications departments in four different universities since 1983. And one of the things I always tell my students is, one of the things that made Brother Malcolm a great person and a great leader was that I have rarely seen anyone who listened the way he did. He was a serious listener. When other people were talking, when we were having those discussions, man, he would be listening to us. You would think we were like, you know, uh, reincarnations of Benjamin Mays or Marcus <laughs> Garvey or somebody. You know, he would be listening to what we were saying. Mm. And then wow. he, would, he would incorporate what he, what he was hearing. And sometimes when he made his presentation, we would hear some of the things that we had said. You know, mm. we said, so uh, only... Uh, a, a great leader has to also be a great listener, and and he was that. He was that. Um, so, like, what thing is like? I know people like Malcolm is very popular now among certain types of people and leadership and organizations. What is one thing that uh, leaders today are missing from the Malcolm X uh, package? Like, you know, you say he was a great listener, he was a great communicator. What are what are some of the things that people are missing today? They, 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 you never hear 
practically, you, you never hear any of the current day leaders talking about the psychological attacks of white supremacy. Yeah. I mean, they will get out there and demonstrate when a policeman shoots somebody and that kind of thing, but they never talk about the, the see the the only person that I have heard who under, who seems to have understood the, the importance of of, of 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 trying to get a, a reward that what we call psychological toxin was Dr. C. Dolores Tucker when she went after that whole gangster rap thing. Mm-hmm. That gangster rap thing was an attack on the minds of young black people, especially young black males. And Dr. Tucker understood that. And she went after them tooth and nails and, and was criticized severely many times by the traditional regular civil rights type of leadership because they, don't, they have never grasped or else talked about or studied or presented to us the, the, how the, the psychological attacks and the psychological attacks are much more deadly to us as a group of people right now than are the physical attacks. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned Stephen Lewis Tucker because I know I heard uh, Professor Jane Smalls talk about Tupac on uh, YouTube uh, early this morning. And Tupac used to date one of his daughters, and he talked to Tupac a couple of days before he died about how Tupac said he was trying to uh, change the game, whatever, trying to uh, take control of distribution of the rap music. He also he was working with um, Biggie Smalls, Notorious B.I.G., and other artists on the, on the East Coast. And he said a lot of stuff that you saw in the media was propaganda by the white media, that it wasn't all true. So like we talk about the media piece. Go ahead. I know she was. Uh, she had said, brother, no matter what they, did, you know, I, 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 I'm really glad to hear that. Mm-hmm. I know, and I tell people all the time. Doc, Dr. Tucker was not against rap music. Mm-hmm. She was against gangster rap. Right. And 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 because she said that as an attack on the minds of young, especially young brothers. And so I'm glad to hear they did that. But I know there was a period of time, though, when they were making vicious attacks on her in their songs. Exactly. And, and, was not, and you can't blame that on the white media. Those yeah. were songs they were singing. Well, you they did, were, I, I want to ask you this, though. You think they could have had, a, a, like, even see the Lawrence Tucker, may she rest in peace, because she had a different approach. Like, Malcolm had a different approach. He didn't try to alienate people on the street. Like, he would talk to the Ph.D., but also he try to, you say, talk to the man on the street in the language that he could understand. Cause I think that what happened in that period, there was a lot of miscommunication on both sides. I, I think Tupac was looking for people to help him out, too. And see the Lord Tucker, I think he would have worked. I don't know. I can't even speak for Tupac, but I think that if they were able to get behind a, in a closed room situation, mm-hmm. things would have worked out better. Don't you think that could have been the case? Yeah, I, I think even she would have, but I, know, I do know, because I was working with her during that time. Yes, sir. And I know she made an outreach. In fact, she had a couple of conversations with uh Oh, uh, Shug, Shug Knight. She had a couple of mm-hmm. meetings with him to talk about that, you know. Wow. And so she was, it was not like, I mean, it, you, she, that she, she, she used to say that what was going on was a working between the gangsters in the streets and the gangsters in the suites. She went, mm. much, she went as much after those big time producers as she did the, uh, the, 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 the gangster rappers themselves. I mean, I know she did that because I, she went after she went to she bought stock and went to a Time Inc. Time Inc. Uh, board meeting and practically shamed Time Inc. and mm. stop stop producing those lyrics. She read them the lyrics. She said, "Y'all making let me hear, let y'all hear what y'all making money off of." Mm. To all these big 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 time white folks at a Time Inc. board meeting, you know, wow. she wasn't she she did not she did not hate those young brothers. She just feel she in fact she believed that they didn't really realize the seriousness mm-hmm. of what they were doing. And Brother but now you say about Brother Malcolm. Brother Malcolm, believe me, that was time when Brother Malcolm came down hard on black folks. Mm-hmm. Because he felt as though we were shucking and jobbing. But he could do it in such a way. And and, and you say, and, and that was time, that there were people at that time who did not like that. Mm-hmm. You know, who did not like that. Because he was saying, and you know, a lot of the stuff y'all are doing, y'all need to stop. Mm-hmm. You all are basically be you all are basically be becoming racist to, to some degree. What he was basically saying, but some of the things that you all are doing, you all are in effect becoming allies of the people out to hurt us. Mm-hmm. And he understood how to you know how to say that. I mean, he 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 he. Sometimes he would be. I go to when I went to the OEU round, man. He'd be giving us, he'd be you know giving us some rough times. Mm-hmm. Because you know, because he said that we would do. It. So he knew, but but it's like a child. A child would take 
And I'm not saying we were children because we weren't, but I'm saying that I was just making the comparison. A child would take tough discipline for someone who who they believe is doing it out of love mm. and who care about them. What what they would resent if they think you're doing it because you basically dislike them. And I think that's what they knew when Brother Malcolm was was was, was coming down on some of the things that we were doing as a group of people. They knew he was doing it from a position of really loving and caring for black folks. What actually, was there friction between uh, OAAU and Mosque Inc.? Was there some friction? And Muslim 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 Muslim. Muslim. No, I, 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 that, that, was, that, was, that was some. You know what I mean? It got to be real on it. It was some. One, because the, 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 most of the people in Muslim Mosque Incorporated had come out of the nation with Brother Malcolm. Mm-hmm. So, of course, they knew him much longer than we did. And and I think some of them begin to feel as though we, you know, I'm talking about those of us who were, who were not Muslim, mm-hmm. that we were like kind of taking up too much of his time, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, and they thought, and I think they thought, and, I re- and they were wrong because the people I know did not think this at all. But I think somehow they almost automatically thought that we thought somehow because some of us had either gone to college or graduate, that we thought we were better, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that was not the case. Then, on the other hand, there were some people in the OAAU who, 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 because of they, they, they felt as though the people out of Muslim Bank Corporate, well, you know, they're really not, they're not sophisticated enough to understand the nuances of of of, of what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally and why he was doing. You see what I'm saying? Right. They 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 they, they say they that they have not got enough sophistication. So 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 that kind of thing was going on. There's no doubt about it. Cannot, okay. cannot deny it. Yeah, actually, like in hindsight, because you are a communication expert, how would you handle that, that situation differently now, knowing all the stuff you know now, the wisdom and knowledge that you have now? I, how would that situation be handled different? I mean, you mean between the two groups? Yes, sir. I had a joint call, like a joint meeting, mm-hmm. to the two to, to specifically talk about just that. And I think if, I think Brother Malcolm would have done that. See, we, we sometimes we forget that Brother Malcolm only had, from the time he became kind of let's say independent from the Nation of Islam, to the time he was assassinated, was a period of only about fourteen or fifteen months. Yeah. And he spent much of that time traveling abroad, especially in the continent and in the Middle East, because he was laying the ground day for his foreign, his his whole. He was determined to internationalize. The movement. That's why we, with the organization of Afro American Unity, we call ourselves a human rights organization, not a civil rights organization, because human rights is the international term. And Brother Malcolm was determined, had a mission of internationalizing the movement and connecting us to the anti colonialist movement that was going on in the world at that time. And so, and so he, well, he spent much of his time doing that during those, that last year, 14 months of his life. And as a result of that, he wasn't around as much as he could have. If he had been around more, I think that kind of stuff would have been settled very quickly. And one of the things I will, always, I will never forget is on that last Sunday, when, I, like I said, I was one of the four or five people backstage talking to him, and one of the things he said to us that Sunday was that I've been invited down to Mississippi at the invitation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, I'm going to go down there and speak, and then when I come back, I'm just going to spend the next six months building up the OAAU. Mm. And I'm sure part of what he would have done would have been to, you know, you know, men, because one thing about people in both groups was that we were, you know, he was the he was the focus. Mm. And I think they would have realized that those little petty differences that we were having, you know, were like, you know, chump change compared to what he was trying to do. And, and there was no need to be bothering him with that kind of, you know, that kind of pettiness. Well, let me ask you this, because I know you mentioned Dr. John Henry Clark, who was a close cousin of Malcolm X as well. He said some of a phrase, I remember him in an interview saying, he said, you got to bury the man and continue the plan. Was the success of both the OAAU and Muslim Mosque Inc. too dependent on the personality of Malcolm? So, uh, I would say yes. And again, he didn't have time to set up a structure. And this happens so with so many black organizations. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I mean, SCLC ain't done nothing since Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm. The Bethune Du Bois Institute that I work for has not done hard practice nothing since Dr. Tucker died. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yes, sir. It's, 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 a, it's a regular pattern because, because uh, uh, you have to set up a succession of, 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 of leadership. And now, considering Brother Malcolm's leadership, abilities and how to organize his organizing abilities i am sure that had he had time he would have done just that with the oaau he would have set up a structure but it's important to remember that he only had acting on his own carrying out his mission was only 14 months Mm. i think people sometimes he was around for a long but but most of the rest of that time he was carrying out the mission of the Nation of Islam and right. and uh, Elijah Muhammad. Mm. He was not carrying out his mission and his his what he considered his mission, and and so he didn't have time to, to structure up. But I mean, he helped structure the Nation of Islam. That's why it ran so well. He founded the newspaper. Right. He, people forget he was a journalist. He used to write a column that ran in some of the black newspapers. And I'm sure that column that, that the column that Mr. Muhammad used to write, I bet you any amount of money Brother Malcolm was writing that column. Mm. He was a journalist. He was a communicator, man. He understood communications all the way around. And I think that had he had a few more months, that, that would have been a structure set up for the OAAU and Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Because he, he was the one who set up the structure that kept the Nation of Islam running so smoothly, and they never had that again after his assassination. They split up into two different groups, and, and, and neither one has really done anything, you know, overly impressive since then. Wow. That's something. So you think, like, overall that black folks are too dependent on the Messiah situation, like having one person come to save us all? There's a need for having, as far as I'm concerned, there's a need for having the great leader. Mm-hmm. But there's also a need for the great leader to make sure that he, that he or she sets up a, 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 a line of succession so that if something happens to that person, then the next person, like this country, one of the reasons for this country's success, that is, it has such stability through the years, is they've had a succession of leadership. And if they haven't had five presidents assassinated, They've never had a coup or anything like that. Why? Because they had this structure mm. in place, and everybody basically accepted the structure when 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 the president was assassinated. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And, and that's I mean, look at Dorothy Hyde and the National Council of Negro Women. You don't hear very much about them since she since she passed. It's like a it's like a it's unfortunately just a continuous pattern. But sometimes many of those people don't have time to, to set up structures, but they didn't do it. Brother Malcolm didn't have the time. I'm certain that he was aware of the need for that because he did it with the Nation of Islam. Mm. I definitely agree. If he had like 12, 13 years like he did with the Nation, he definitely would have had that, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He had a lot of time. And he, like, he was only 39 when he died, which is incredible that he was able to achieve as much as he, as much he, as he did. did at 39 years old. Imagine this. He had like a little, I mean, because so seven days before he got killed, his house was burned down in Queens, right? It was yeah. house settled. So did he have like a, a fire? Yes. So did he, do you think that he was uh, embracing death? Did he like he was a walking dead man at that moment when you saw him last? I don't think he was embracing death. I think he was a realist. And he understood that, that there were forces out to kill him. He clearly understood that. And he understood that that uh, he may not yeah. Martin Luther King understood the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, you have to... I think many times people don't understand what was going on. In this country at that time, there was terrorism going on. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you can describe it. Terrorism. Mm. And which the government, was, as Brother Malcolm said, was either unable or unwilling to deal with. Now, I think Brother Malcolm's assassination ended up being a collaboration between elements in the Nation of Islam and the government forces, especially the FBI. I think it was a it was a collaboration between those two forces. I don't I don't 
I think they, they and, and you don't have to have a collaboration. You don't have to get together and sit down and sign no pack. It can be, all kind of things can be understood. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just did, like, you know, was it true that Malcolm contacted the State Department two weeks before he got killed saying that his life was in danger? Is that true? I don't know. I don't know about that. I know I was looking at an old uh, footage from the, around the time he got killed, and James Farmer was at a press conference. Mm-hmm. And he said that Lyndon B. Johnson, because you can find this online, he said that Lyndon B. Johnson asked him, has anybody found out what happened to that Malcolm fellow yet? And James Farmer said it back then that he felt like Malcolm Delph was an international conspiracy. Of course it was. Mm-hmm. I mean, when Malcolm X landed and flew from London to Paris, Mm-hmm. The French government would not even allow him to come into the to the state airport. Who who called who called the the goal? Elijah Muhammad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, Brother Malcolm was embarked on a campaign to internationalize the movement, to make a make a tie up between what was going on in the especially in Africa and this country, the African fight against colonialism. Very right here now. This is again, as I said before. I am not in any way absolving the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam, the, the people who pulled the triggers and shot Brother Malcolm down were members of the nation of Islam. And the nation, and the nation of Islam as an organization has, it, basically for all practical purposes, died on that day. Now you still see the name around, but they haven't, look, they haven't really... They, the the biggest thing that the the the, the, the that the one part which is one led by uh, Mr. Farrakhan done was to uh, help organize the, uh, the 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 Million Man March. Other than that, what have they done? Hmm. Do you think Farrakhan had something to do with Malcolm Delta, directly or indirectly? I think Farrakhan himself said that that yeah. he had an indirect role in it. I saw something recently where he said that to one of the daughters. Right. Yes. The, the oldest, yeah. So uh, you know that's uh, that's uh, that, I mean so that's that's not but but it was a collaboration. Mm. And the yeah, we, they had brother Malcolm, brother you people don't understand this. Brother Malcolm's goal internationally was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights and charge it with being either unable to protect the, the lives and property of black people. Now, that's unheard of. Now, we know the United States government could have told the U.N. Commission on Human Rights, you kiss my royal behind, but the propaganda, mm-hmm. the propaganda thing would have been enormous. You have to, under, during that period between 1955 and 1965, when Brother Malcolm was on the scene, this country was involved in a tremendous propaganda war with the Soviet Union. And, and, and this country, every they were trying to all they they were constantly being the Soviet Union was constantly using the race the race thing in this country to attack the United States uh, among people of color around the world. Mm. So the United States was con- so if a brother Malcolm had been able to get this to even be discussed at the UN. Wow, this is what we're talking about here. So the states yeah, were definitely when, yeah. brother Malcolm, when Brother Malcolm went to that old organization, African Unity Conference in 1964, he was the first time an African American had been invited to be there as an observer. He was not a participant. Mm-hmm. But he was invited as an observer, and he distributed documents, one of which I have in my book, in which he laid out his plans for internationalizing the movement. And as a result of the groundwork that he laid, the OAU conference, for the first and only time in its history, issued a resolution condemning discrimination in the United States. That was unheard of in 1964. Yeah. I know I talked to Dick Gregory not too long ago, and he was saying that Malcolm X, the idea he had to come up with the uh, take the United States before the UN was put in his head by a brother who was a king, I believe. Uh, East African brother who was actually killed the same day he was. Uh, Pinto. Yeah, that's the guy. Thank a, you. A Kenyan guy named named Pinto. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether I don't know whether this put this was put into his head. But mm-hmm. I don't know that he and this he and he and this brother, you know, had met in Kenya, and uh, and it and he was this he was uh, he was killed. Brother Malcolm had been in Kenya. He had spoken to the, to uh, to. Uh, uh, some of the Kenyan, uh, you know, political li- figures. His, mm-hmm. 
He had been, when he traveled in Africa, he had been invited to state dinners and treated almost like he was a foreign minister mm. from, from us to Africa. Yes, sir. And the, and, the, and the United States government did not like that. Again, you have to put it into the context of the time. This is 1965, 1965. This was the height of the so-called Cold War. Mm. And the United States government was under constant pressure coming because the Russians were using this as propaganda against them. In fact, I read that, remember when, when Little Rock happened? You may be too young to remember that. Mm-hmm. When Little Rock happened, I think it was 1957. President Eisenhower kept saying, well, there's nothing we can do. That's a state situation. The federal government can't do nothing. Blah, 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 blah. And then when they say one day one of his aides brought in the Russian newspaper Pravda and showed him the front page, and the whole front page was filled with articles about, and photographs about Little Rock. The next day, he nationalized the Arkansas National Guard and had to protect those children. Mm. Like, I mean, I'm a, so, so this whole wow. thing, you know, when you put this into that context, you can see why government agencies did not like one bit what Brother Malcolm was trying to do. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because I know you fast forward 50 years later, uh, the parents of Mike Brown, they talked to representatives of the U.N., and the U.N. did have some harsh words. And also the, uh, Iran and ISIS even said they supported black folks in America having their own country. But that's so not think, the same. That's not, ahead, the same as, that's not the same. I mean, we, you, 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 that's only, that's kind of small potatoes compared to what, what that, that time, 1965, 1965. Mm-hmm. You know, and we, in fact, one of the reasons that this stuff, is, some of this stuff is going on now. It's because, I'll be very frank with you, and some people get upset when I say this. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. When, when, when black folks were being lynched regularly in the, in the early 1900s up until the 1950s, the federal government kept saying, there's nothing we can do. This is state, blah, 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 nothing we can do. There was no outside pressure. So they, they, the lynchings continued. Mm-hmm. I believe that if this country had not been involved in that propaganda war with the Soviet Union, the federal government would have set back, like they did with the lynching thing situation, and allowed those state governments to crush the civil rights movement. And this is not to deny the courageousness and sincerity of those brothers and sisters who put their lives on the line. But I think if this country had, the federal government would have stayed out of it and said there's nothing we can do, like they said when everybody was being lynched. And basically, like they are saying now, a lot of some of the things that were passed during those times are being taken away and done away with, and things are happening. And no, but this country don't have no, they don't have no propaganda thing to deal with like they had in the 1960s when they were involved in that big propaganda war with the Soviet Union, when those African countries were getting their independence from the colonial and all that stuff was going on. It was a, it was a term. People have to, it, one thing, young black people need to be made aware of the intensity of that propaganda war. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and why, and why, and how the, the, the Russians were using this in the international arenas against the United States. Mm-hmm. So the federal government was forced to act. They couldn't sit back like they did when the, they did, I mean, when the Nazis were there, Nazis couldn't care less. I mean, and, and, it, and by the way, this is not to say that the Russians care one hour about us. They didn't. They just looked upon us as a weapon they could use against the United States. Right. It wasn't that they, that they loved us. Yeah, it was just politics. It, 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 was, it, was, it was a weapon they could use against the United States internationally. And that's what, and, 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 and that's what they did. And, and that, forced, that forced the federal government to, to move in and, and protect people. And that's why they did that. Otherwise, if they, if they had not done that, they would have sat on the sidelines as those state governments you know, were shooting people and killing I mean, they did it. They did it to a large extent anyway, but it would have been much worse. So I guess now we've got to revise history because the Soviet Union is just now getting their credit for defeating the Nazis in World War II. And now you said it was like one of the biggest elements to help the civil rights movement as well in America. I didn't say they were the advocates. Mm. I say they used the civil rights movement as a weapon to attack the United States mm-hmm. in the international arena. You know, in this country, saying they're democ- Democrats and, and all this kind of stuff, equal rights. And look what they're doing to the black folks. Right. 
And I can see you saying that now, right? Yeah, if you and use I, that and kind I, of and yeah. and as I said before, they were not doing it because they liked us. Right. Okay, say to you. They were not doing it because they liked us. The Russians are white folks, and they have, I think they have the same attitude toward black folks and other people of color as the rest of white folks do. But they saw an opportunity to use something against the United States. They took advantage of it. And Brother Malcolm and, and Dr. King too also was aware of this, you know, the, of, 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 of this, of, this uh, of, the, of, of the United States, of the, the federal government having to act for international mm-hmm. reasons. Right. That makes sense. I also want to uh, go back to, like you said, elements within the nation of Islam that helped to kill Malcolm. Now, we know now that the secretary for the nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad's secretary, John Ali, he was FBI. At one point, he was friends with uh, Malcolm X. I have heard from reliable sources that he was a a third-ranking man in the nation, and he was an FBI informant. Mm. And when I wrote, when I helped uh, Rodney Collins, Brother Malcolm's nephew, write the book Malcolm X a Man and His Times, uh, 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 in that book, uh, it is said that that John Ali and Brother Malcolm actually shared a house together with their families. Right. And one day the, the police busted in on them, and they took Brother Malcolm to one room and John Ali to the other room. And Sister Ella Collins, Brother Malcolm's sister. Believes, and I assume she believes this because Brother Malcolm said that to her. That that's when they turned John Ali and mm. made him into an informant. Wow! But he had that type of power for the nation, and he also was responsible, like for handling Elijah Muhammad's uh, letters. Correct? Like people write him letters. Yeah. It would be the one. So Malcolm would write. So don't tell him what he would have done to the letters if Malcolm written to Elijah Muhammad, and then the ones that Elijah gave to Malcolm, right? He could have manipulated those letters, right? The correspondence. Yeah. No. So he there's changed book, history. There's a book called there's a book out called The Pathology of Leaders. And the book is about how world events have been affected because a major player was ill, was not well. Mm-hmm. And that book made me wonder what would have happened if Elijah Muhammad had not been sick. Because he was a sick man at that time, mm-hmm. and and would he have? Because and when you're sick, you're vulnerable. You listen to what people are, and if right. people are feeding you constant information, you better watch Malcolm X. You better watch him. He's getting too big. You know, but I'm doing that kind of thing. And you're not well. Now, see, if he had been well, he might have said, he might have said, uh, Malcolm, come out here so we can talk. Let's see what's going on here. Right. But that book made me think about that. But this, of course, does not in any way, as far as I'm concerned, absolve. Elijah Muhammad, of, of 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 his role in the assassination of Brother Malcolm, mm. but it's but it did make me think, uh, you know about, uh, you know after I read that that book about how what would had Elijah Muhammad been well, I don't think he would have been as vulnerable to the rumors that were being spread by some people in the nation who wanted to get rid of Brother Malcolm and by the government. Because you, I, you know, we've all heard about you know making phone calls and and saying you know you better watch out, look out for Malcolm X, and then call them Brother Malcolm's people and saying things. You know, I mean, they were you know it was just this people. I don't. It's really hard sometimes, brother. I think to make people understand that that period, nineteen fifty five, nineteen sixty five. Mm-hmm. That was that was a rough period, both internationally and nationally. That was the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Hungarian. Uh, uh, uprising against the right. I mean, it was major events happened the, uh, during that time, and uh, uh, and 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 so this country, the federal government had to be very conscious of, of what it was doing because it, it, it was it was in you that one thing. When what really, and I remember getting very nervous when I read it. A New York City newspaper when they were having the debates on the Congo in 1964. Mm-hmm. When the United States, England, and Belgium had invaded the Congo under the pretext that they were trying to save some white nuns who were being attacked by quote unquote African savages, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure most people don't know this. At the UN, when they were having the UN debate on that situation, two African diplomats, one from Guinea and one from Ghana, for the first time in history, it hadn't, hadn't happened before, and it hasn't happened since. They basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, but I have the direct quotes in my book. 
They said, if the United States has the right to invade the Congo to protect these nuns, who's to say that we don't have the right to provide military assistance to the black people who are under attack in Mississippi? Mm. Wow. Now, can you imagine what J. Edgar Hoover felt like when he heard <laughs> two UN wow. two UN diplomats making that statement at a, in the UN debate? And, wow. and, and and the newspaper that reported it that I got it out of was a conservative white newspaper in New York City called the New York Herald Tribune. And the paper said that the the US ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, and other Western diplomats were astounded. And this were their words, were astounded when they heard that connection. And I love that. All because wow. of, that was all because of the groundwork laid by Brother Malcolm. So he had to go. They already knew he had to go. Do you hear me? <laughs> he had to go. Okay. So they tried to poison him as well on his trip to Africa, right? They were trying to poison him a couple of times? Well, one time, yes. I know for sure. They said that one time I read that it happened, yes. They followed him everywhere he went. Did he know he was government people from the U.S.? Did he understand he was CIA people? Or how did he look at them? Like, they, they, were, they, were, they were since the CIA's job is to handle things abroad. They were CIA people. He already knew that was who they were. He knew that who they were. Do you understand, like, the, like what they were trying to do? I mean, I heard uh, audio of him talking to, allegedly talking to FBI people trying to turn him over to an informant. Like, is that authentic? You know, they say he had, like, a tape recorder underneath his couch. The FBI yeah. would try to pay a visit, and they'll try to turn him. But he and they, ta- they, and they, ta- they, t- they taped the whole conversation. Right. So that's real. That's authentic. Okay, I was making sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. wow. Yeah. Man, Jesus. I, can't, I just don't, I, I, we don't really have an understanding or appreciation what you know, people like Malcolm and what you all had to endure and go through. I mean, were you involved in the movement before coming up north to New York City? Were you involved? I know you're from the South, correct? I was, I was, I was born. I was raised in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. That's my mm. home. Uh, I was in I was in Tuskegee when the Montgomery Bus boycott started. Okay. And I remember I was a teenager then. I remember that there were people in Tuskegee who would drive down about 35 miles away. They would drive down to Montgomery and help ride people around so they wouldn't have to take the buses. Mm. That was kind of like my, you know, my uh, becoming more aware of, of, you know, of larger racial issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but my first political activism was when I was a student at Howard University. I was a student at Howard in 1960 when the Greensboro sit-ins occurred, when those four brothers sat down at the Woolworths in uh, North Carolina, from North Carolina A&T College and now University, when they sat down and refused to move in Woolworths. Mm-hmm. I was, I was, uh, I was uh, at Howard then. So uh, the student government leader at Howard organized a group of us, and we went over and picketed the Woolworths in, uh, in Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, to show our support for the brothers down there, and that was my first political activism. Wow. So I guess so. Yeah, like man, and you when, I came, when I when I was when I was when I when I was in after I said it was the two years at Howard, and then I was in New York, and I was involved in when they started the whole school, the, the uh, quality school movement in New York. I was a part of that. I was working with Jesse Gray in the rent strike group. I was doing all those things before I met Brother Malcolm. Mm. But after okay, I, was, well, okay. but after I heard him speak in July of 1962, that was that became my. But I didn't really because I because I was not going to become a Muslim. Although I heard him speak for the first time, and I became a supporter. And wherever he spoke in the New York area, I would always be there between 62 and 64. I didn't actually meet him until 1964. Mm. Wow. But you heard him first in 62 live. In 62, and, wherever, and from that moment on, if he was speaking anywhere in the New York City metropolitan area, I was there. Mm. Wow, that's something he had. I had talked to a sister from St. Louis. Uh, she had did a poem. She lives in St. Louis now. But she used to talk about how she used to get off the subway. Uh, I did 125th, and she would hear Malcolm talk. This was back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. And she wouldn't pay him no mind. She said, why does fool keep on talking every day about this and that? And then I think one day something happened to her and she experienced some type of form of racism. Mm-hmm. And then one day when she heard him speak, it all made sense. Yeah. It finally clicked. It took a, it took a while, though, for it to click. Ma- he was a master teacher, man. He made, he made, he, he, he made you, you really understand what white supremacy and racism was all about. 
he cut through all of the, you know, the BS and the and the double talk and the and the, and and let you know what it was really all about. And like I said before, when you heard Brother Malcolm speak, you may not become a supporter, but he sure made you whatever you did believe in. You went back and had to do a little bit of studying of it. Mm-hmm. You know to uh, you know to make sure you had your stuff correct because he he uh, if you didn't have it, you know he 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 would challenge you. He made you if you didn't hear but you didn't uh, if you don't want to deal with what he was saying, you had to go back and reinforce whatever your beliefs were. All right. Because he didn't you know, give you no he didn't give you no slack. You know what? Something though, I, I keep on thinking. You just put that in my head. I'm thinking about like I remember talking with Carl Michael reading some of the stuff that Carl Michael said about Dr. King, the way he was able to preach, like he could talk about the geopolitical history uh, and social or whatever Vietnam in a three hour or two hour sermon. So a person might have a limited educational background. They might have had, didn't even finish elementary school mm-hmm. and make it plain, like Brother Michael said, make it plain. And when, yesterday was the 45th anniversary of the of the state lynching of Fred Hampton Senior. And all these three men had the ability to take complex ideas and philosophies and really make it plain to the people. And, you know, it is like somebody said from here, Washington's uh, cabinet, a white guy, he said, the people in the 60s made it their business to kill the right ones. The it white supremacists, they killed the right ones. They knew who, which ones to kill. Mm-hmm. They, they killed the right ones. They left the ones behind. Like, you know, I look at, they killed Malcolm, they oh, left Farrakhan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They yeah. killed Ma- Martin, they left Jesse. They, they yeah. killed Fred and Hampton, they left Bobby Rush. They, they, said they killed the right ones. They knew who were the real, the real, mm-hmm. for them, mm-hmm. it was going to be the real problem. Wow. I read in, in August 13, 2013, when they had the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Mm-hmm. The Washington Post ran an article that day, a rather long article. Mm-hmm. In which they said that now you know I have a dream that they have reduced Dr. King's speech that day to I have a dream. That's all year. Right. I have a dream. I have a dream. I, have a dream. I would not go to any program uh, around Dr. King with the word dream in it. <laughs> a person, that's my own personal thing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the, the Washington Post ran an article on August 28, 2013, in which they say that after hearing Dr. King's March on Washington speech, the FBI under Hoover's direction, launched one of the biggest surveillance operations in its history. So when King watched that speech, he was hearing much more than I have a dream. See, he heard the the forefathers of this country gave us a promissory note, and we come here today to cash that check. Mm. He heard heard there would be no peace, and there would be no peace in this country until justice emerges like so and so and so and so. So He heard now is the time. That's what Hoover heard, and Hoover put his boys out there, launched the biggest surveillance operation in the country's history as a result of the March on Washington speech. You would never know that if you listened to it, to listen to what people say, because all they talk about is I have a dream. Right. Well, Hoover actually knew what this meant. He would knew the deal. So he was, it, was, it was a good reason why he was paranoid. The way he was. considered, who would consider, which consider Martin Luther King as as a as a potential future black nationalist. Yeah. Well, actually, when you say he was turning towards the end, like was he turning towards nationalism and in the way he from nonviolence? I think that who I, I'm not going to. All I got to say to people who ask me that question is read Dr. King's book. Where do we go from here? Chaos our community. Yes. That was his last book, published less than a year before he was assassinated, and it's written in the first person. And I have read excerpts in that books to my students, and I said, who said that? They said Malcolm X. I said, no, that's Dr. King talking. Oh, wow. Mm. So it is like... The, the king that they are promulgating out there today mm-hmm. is not the king who wrote Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos our community. I think the King King people went along with that to get that holiday. They wanted the holiday, so they went along with the, with, you know, with with reducing him to I Have a Dream. Also, he did a speech at Stanford, like, right before he died, not too long before he died. They talk about another, like, you know, 
they really, you know, put the fire on America. Like, it really, it's like it held American society accountable for more than, you know, what he's known for doing. It was, it was, they, they, I'm telling you, man, they don't. Uh, you know, I'm at my job and I had a phone. Uh, I can't say that now. <laughs> that was all right. yeah, I, got I think there's a phone call for me coming in. I keep, I keep telling, but, but yeah, man, uh, those two brothers. What else? What can you say about two dudes? Mister yeah, Saint, could, could you tell them to call me back? I'm, I'm being interviewed on radio. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that 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 people, both of these brothers had options. Mm-hmm. They had made major contributions. They could have. They were both. They were. When they were both seven, they were 39. They could have stopped and said, "Listen, I'm now going to focus on my family." I, and 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 Martin Luther King Party would now could have become president of Morehouse, or the, or the pastor of some big, you know, right. Baptist church. But the Malcolm had all kind of job offers to teach uh, on the African continent and other places. But these brothers didn't do it. They they kept struggling for us. To the point of being assassinated. For somebody who did not do that, I don't want to hear no criticism of either one of them. Because yeah. both of them had options. They had the option of, of saying, "I've done, I've done my share. I'm, I'm now, I'm out. I'm out of here." But they stayed in the struggle until they were both assassinated. Wow. So you know, I, I really don't want to be hearing. You know, people putting them down. They were, they were, they were, neither one of them was perfect. They were human beings. That's one thing about Brother Malcolm that also very impressed me. He did not want to be treated like some kind of God. You know, he was a great human being, a great black man. And that's the way we should depict him, not as though he's some kind of, you know, uh, God or something. No, I, I, I know you're a cultural critic in theater. You, you actually reviewed a lot of theater work. You actually reviewed... The first time I believe Tupac's debut on the stage in the Raising in the Sun, Travis. Well, I didn't. I didn't review it, but 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 uh, one of my favorite theater people in New York was a brother named Ernie McClintock. Mm-hmm. Ernie had a very solid theater company, and he did a production of Raising in the Sun that was as good as the one that, that had been on Broadway years before. Yeah. And Tupac Shakur played the boy, played the played the played the you know. Uh, the, the the role of the boy mm-hmm. in that in that in that uh in that play it was he a standout was he impressive I mean how was it I mean people I mean, he was, he was, and, and you, you didn't even think about it you know it was just, I, only, I didn't even realize this until Ernie told me this years later mm-hmm. you know uh, I didn't realize it I didn't, didn't, didn't associate the two things wow uh, that's something man you you, you live an interesting life. And I want to ask you this too, because we know we got the the movie Selma coming out. That you know it's about Dr. King and the Selma movement back in '65. Mm-hmm. Coming out early next year. You know we also have a Malcolm X movie. We had the one that was done on Lifetime, Betty and Coretta. Do you think Hollywood? I mean, I thought this year Hollywood has it. Has any movie actually did the Malcolm X story any type of justice? No. Did Spike Lee do it justice? A, or movie, a movie. A movie. A movie that I want to see a Brother Malcolm will never, you hear me, the word never come out of Hollywood. Mm. Never. Spike did about as well as you can do coming out of Hollywood. Mm. It ain't coming out of Hollywood. It, it just ain't happening. I get suspicious about any kind of black movie because they, they water them down. Mm. They, 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 uh, uh, as I said, uh, I think that, that, that Spike did about as, as, as well as you're going to be able to do. But I tell people, if you see the movie on Brother Malcolm, and I said it back at the time, and I see it now, you cannot look at that movie and say, you know, Brother Malcolm. You can't. You, he left, he left, had all kinds, of, there are all kinds of, 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 of tapes of his speeches. He, you have stuff where you can hear him act. And the same way with Dr. King. You don't, you're not dependent on, 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 on Hollywood movies to know these men. Right. They left a lot of verbal tapes and 
books behind so you can go and listen to them in their own words. That's right. The movies that best can maybe introduce youngsters to them. But if you let them see them and then think, babe, I now know Dr. King, it's impossible. Because they, they don't want to, this country, the Hollywood will never say that in this country between 1955 and 1965, there was absolute terrorism going on. And that terrorism was not being punished. It was, it was terrorism. How do we not gonna say that? You know what's strange though, like when it comes to Hollywood, I mean I was at a um at NYU uh last month and they had a thing about the Harlem Hellfighters. And it was this white professor from Howard, he was talking about how uh the Harlem Hellfighters story was portrayed in popular culture. It's like a lot of books and movies and stuff about the Harlem Hellfighters, they don't want to tell the truth. But if you look at the truth of the Harlem Hellfighters, it is way more impressive than the in the crappy fiction. Like the story of Sergeant Henry Johnson taking on 24 Germans with just a knife? Yeah. That's yeah. more impressive than Alvin York. I always tell people, if Alvin York is Mickey Mantle, then, uh, then Sergeant Johnson is Willie Mays. Yeah. yeah. He's very more impressive. Because, but then they got to overdo it. They got actually, like, even with the Malcolm movie, what bothers me is that it was Malcolm's family that got him into the Nation of Islam, but he got this fictional Minister Baines character. Yeah. And I thought the people, people actually think that's a real person. Yeah. But it's a composite person. Yeah. One of the things they, they continuously try to do with Brother Malcolm is to co opt him by talking about make it sound as though he went through some kind of St. Paul on the road to Damascus exactly. type change. I hate that. You know, yeah. and, that, and all, I, I say to them, all you got to do is the brother said, and the, the classic example to me is that if, when he says that young woman, white woman, that he heard him speak up in New England somewhere, that she came to New York and she came and said, asked him could she, was there anything she could do, and he looked at her very straight, but he said no. And she cried and left and that kind of thing. And he said, now, if she came to me now, this is after he had found in the OAU and was kind of operating on his own, he said, I will tell her, yes, there's something you can do. You can go work in the white community and work yeah. with them and try to change that. That was a ch- Now, if you're saying that, that was a change. Right. But it was not some kind of St. Paul on the road to Damascus type change. She was never going to be a member of the Organization of Afro-American Unity. That's right. And so this whole idea that, that, that he was, the integrationists tried to claim, then the, the white left wing tried to claim he was becoming this and that with them and all that kind of stuff. That is all, everybody's trying to write it, but Brother Malcolm was a Pan-Africanist and a nationalist. And people think that automa- nationalists not only do, are not some kind of insulated, uh, unintelligent people they try to depict us as. We are people who see or have a very strong worldview. Mm-hmm. You know, it's stupid to think that black people can function in this world all by themselves and never deal with other people. That would be a stupid position. But we believe that when you when you form alliances with other groups, you form a position of strength. You don't go in there like it's the junior partner. Right. If, it, if, this, if this particular group is, has something that we can work them on, we work with them on that issue. But we will never be tied to them. The Democrats are the Republicans. The conservatives are the progressives. Are the socialists? Are the white communists? Are the none? We won't be part of any organization run by white folks. We don't care what their ideology was. I want you mentioned that because you know we also like last year was the uh, I believe was the uh, the getting right. I want to say the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, message to the grassroots. If I'm, I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And Brother Malcolm talking about the farce on Washington and about the big six. And now we saw this past Monday, it's like President Obama is trying to create his own big six, you know, from this generation of civil rights activists or whatever you want to call it. And we know Brother Malcolm talked about police brutality a lot 50 years ago. I mean, you go on YouTube, like stuff he was saying yesterday sounds more relevant today, which is unfortunate because it's 50 years later. So I want to get your take on the situation with the um, Mike Brown, the Eric Gardner, the protests, the quote-unquote uprisings and whatnot. And how you feel about that? All I can say is this, brother. After, mm-hmm. the, after, the, after the killing of James, 15-year-old James Powell by that New York City cop in 1964 and the Harlem uprising, I wrote an editorial in the volume one, number two, 
of the OAAU newsletter. Mm-hmm. And what I said was, basically was that, see, these kind of things happen to us because we are powerless, and we are powerless because we don't have unity. That with unity, that will come power. With power will come respect. And, 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 and people, will, people will have to be wary of messing with us if we have some kind of unity. And when I read that thing, I'm just kind of paraphrasing it, but when mm-hmm. I read it, I could have put it into some paper today and don't mm-hmm. change one word. Mm-hmm. Fifty years later, we responded to these kind of things in the exact same way, a bunch of chanting and, and, and see, all I, what I said in a column that I just wrote, when people start doing all that chanting and, and virus and all that kind of stuff, all you're doing is two things. Number one, you are providing a propaganda windfall for the haters like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. And number two, you, you're giving the cops huge paychecks with all the over, overtime they have to do. Right. That's all you're doing. You know, it's funny because like, even when, like, when the Governor Jay Nixon, we declared a state of emergency, all they're doing is letting the federal government pay the, like, for the overtime for the cops. Cause, you know, people, it's always about state rights, state rights, state rights. But if you can get the federal government to pick up the tab, by all means, get the federal government to intervene. And that's what Governor Jay Nixon was doing in Missouri. I call it misery, getting the federal government to pay the, t- uh, the overtime for the police. And it never occurred to the black folks that them are making that announcement at nine, that was a that was a trap, right? To make that announcement at nine o'clock. I ain't never in my forty some years <laughs> journalist seen a seen a, 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 a something of that importance announced at nine o'clock at night. They mm. wanted what happened. They wanted fires to be set so they could show that on television. And that distracts away from the lack of an indictment. And the people fell right into the trap. In fact, I would not be surprised, to be very frank with you, if the people who set the fires were not allies of the of the authorities in Ferguson. Oh. And if you get my answer, boy, I'm sorry. And if they did, the people who set the fires and the people who do the looting whether they mean to or not, they are basically working in collaboration with the folks out to do us in. Yeah, I was thinking about when that church got set on fire. I, I kept on thinking back to the 90s where they was burning a lot of black churches. I don't believe no black person that night set those fires. I mean, I don't believe it was like, I believe it was like some government entity, or maybe it could have been some, some white supremacist organization outside the government. Yeah, well, that's what I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. That's why when they said they were going to do that thing at night, black folks should have said, Okay, we're going to stay in our homes until tomorrow morning. Okay. That was a trap. Mm. By doing it at night, and then, so what did the television focus on for all the rest of the night and all the next day? The fires burning. Right. And most of the discussion was away from the fact that this policeman was unindicted. Mm. What about the response in New York over the last couple of days? It's been rather peaceful. I mean, they shut down the Brooklyn Bridge, quote, unquote. Yeah. I, and I, Chen and all that stuff ain't don't ain't happening. This that if the, if this country was involved in a propaganda thing, now the way they were in nineteen sixties, that kind of stuff might work. It don't work in it don't work in twenty fourteen. If you 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 get much more thing if you used your collective economic power to bring up you know to to force. Or to to bring certain things up, that would be that would do much more to to help advance this thing than than walking through the street chanting no justice no peace and hands up don't shoot. So like what happened on Black Friday and on Cyber Monday should be continued like you know stop participating you in a system economically that demeans and devalues you. If we we want to really say something about those what things that have been happening. Mm-hmm. We, we would say we would say that we are we are cutting down our shopping. Mm-hmm. At least by half, if not more, in all the stores, that would be a, that would be a louder and bigger and more effective response than to come to people march through the streets singing "No justice, no peace," and 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 and, and, and doing a whole lot of woofing. Well, like this, you think people like I keep on thinking about Patrick Henry. I had this discussion with my relatives over Thanksgiving, and I said one thing about the white folks back in the Revolutionary War, they were serious about their liberation. They said, give me liberty or give me death. 
I don't believe black folks believe that we are serious enough to put our lives on the line. Like what Brother Malcolm said, you know, you, you're not ready to die for it. Take the word freedom out of your mouth. You know, when you put your life, you got to be ready. To argue. You don't put your lives on the line and no foolishness. Right. I agree with you on that. You be ready. Mm hmm. But if it comes down to that, if you, like, you know, actually stand up for something you believe in, if it came down to giving your life, you got to be willing to give it, correct? Right now, all you got to do is give it. Don't we? I bet you all those people right there now are shouting, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, hands up, don't shoot, all that kind of stuff. If you put them and say, brothers and sisters, man, we're going to start a movement. One of the first things we want to do is uh, put together, raise some money so we put together an incredible website. That's what's going on. I, and we, I'll be asking everybody here, to give us ten dollars to do that, I bet you wouldn't get ninety percent of people wouldn't give you a dime. Oh, but you think like it's quite possibly that some of the attitudes are changing? Because even with some of the black businesses got burnt in Ferguson, like one lady, the cake lady, she was able to raise like uh, six figures worth of money in a matter of hours through crowdfunding. You don't think people's mentalities are slowly changing now? Because we know about the police brutality. Well, like, why you don't know, you burn, why don't you burn a business down in the first place? Not, I don't know. We did, I don't know the. You know, I don't know who actually burned it down. Like we we speculating, but I'm saying the fact that people did respond by giving her money, like to try to rebuild her business so she could finish her cakes for Thanksgiving. I mean, I thought that was black power in action. Yeah. So you said we come together for something. Yeah, black folks did it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but but our response though. But then I look at strategy too, because we should be doing the same things we done 50 years ago. We should be beyond that. We should be beyond that, brother. Mm -hmm. I I definitely agree with that. When I was living in Richmond, Virginia, Mm -hmm. they were were talking about a a, a white dude in Richmond with a high school education get a loan from Richmond banks quicker than a black person with a Ph.D. Mm. And they were talking about, oh, we're going to demonize. I said, you know, all you have to do is line up in front of those banks and take your money out of those banks. There you go. There's a black bank in Richmond. One of the first female found up a bank in America was a black woman in Richmond. That's true. I told them about that recently. You're right. Magdalene Walker. Put your money in mm-hmm. that bank. Well, we kind of have to trust each other, though. You the white folks are the people you should be trusting. And you pay the way. consequences. <laughs> you pay the consequences. Mm-hmm. You pay the I mean, I think it's fascinating. I'm, I'm glad I'm talking to you because you actually well, been there I'm, done I'm going to have to move on, bro. You know, we I, 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 I got to get... <laughs> I've been on now over, almost over an hour. Yeah, but I want, I want to take, uh, it's a person from St. Louis, though, I guess, uh, one caller. You mind if I take okay. one question? Okay, uh, I'll take right. a couple of callers, but I got to, like, really? Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Eric 314, welcome to We All Be. Thank you for uh, joining us. Hello? Yeah, how you doing? How you doing, <laughs> sir? What's your name? My name is Pianchi. Hi, right, brother Pianchi. I know who you are. To you. Go ahead. Conversation. <laughs> Somebody had called me and I had to run back to the phone. Mm-hmm. But the knowledge gentleman is, is telling some good history about Malcolm. And I do live here in the St. Louis area. I've been living here for a long time. But uh, I don't think, uh, I think, you know, he made, some, he he told the truth when he said the nation is going to die when Malcolm X got killed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it still is dead. Uh, today is a whole different day. Yeah, I look, I'm not too far from Ferguson, so I've been watching that. This this has been going on for a long time, and there's different reasons for why it's uh, like it is. And uh, I think there's a lot of there is a lot of behind the scenes things to try to make economic changes, but. I hear we uh, blacks talk about this unity, and I really don't think the unity that blacks that we talk about is going to happen here in the United States today. I think that that chance has passed and it's uh, it's gone. But I do think there is a, a still great potentials for the economic gains to be had. Uh, more so than uh, these gains to be had under one philosophy. And so, well, I, I, I'm not saying that when I say unity, I, I'm saying I'm that, not arguing. I'm just, uh-huh. I'm just yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
But you won't have any econ- we won't have any group economic gains unless we have more group unity. Where we like to maybe, for instance, like support black businesses. Mm-hmm. We so we we have we have well, made we have sent hundreds of children of Indians and Arabs and Koreans and Jews to college from stores in the black community. But when you tell people about starting something in the black, you know what they say? Yeah, you you know. Uh, you got a, you got a, you got a, uh, what do you call it? You you got a, uh, uh, reach out, not reach out. What's the word when you got to you got to reach out to get other people. Uh, you want to do oh, economic work. No, not that. We, if you want to do something economic, you got to, tra- I yeah, can't think right. But all I know is this, John A. Johnson with Ebony Magazine, mm-hmm. never for a single moment when he, he made, he became a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. And he, he not, and that one time in this entire, that I remember him ever saying, I got to r- r- put Ebony up in such a way so the white folks buy Ebony. He didn't put white folks on the cover of Ebony. In fact, they're so rare that, it's, that they're collector's items. I collect black magazines. I have one with Archie Bunker on the cover. The only time a white man was on Ebony by himself. That, that magazine right now, I sold one for $150. Mm-hmm. You know, so so my thing is, if we don't start, if we don't start practicing some kind of using our collective uh, economic potential to advance each other, buy from each other, support each other, and that kind of thing, then we, you pay the consequences. Well, I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree with that. But I'm saying is that this thing about the uh, getting people to come under one umbrella is uh, that's not going to. Uh, what about well. some of the other people? And when I talk come- about, well, those people come here with a difference. See, you don't educate your children. That's a, that's the big problem. It's it's very difficult to change a person once they're forty years old, thirty five years old. You got uh, schools here. You had some, we had some uh, African centered schools where you could teach your children what you want to, and still uh, demand high economic achievement. But we don't have that. And children today, when they become of age, they do not have that cohesiveness based on uh, which I support nationalism and pan-Africanism, but they just don't think. we have. It has to be a different strategy. And the, the idea of opening up retail businesses, buying from Asians wholesale, that's not going to work because uh, Asians are not going to sell to you at family prices where you can compete against that's their That's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm already. saying. All we have to do is don't buy from Well, I'm Asians. not saying that's what you're saying. All we have to do well, is don't well, buy from Then we have I don't to manufacture. Care. You have to manufacture and produce yourself. Okay, fine. Then you do that. Well, that's you what I'm that. talking about. Uh, you, and in order to have viable business, you have to have viable businesses and that you manufacture and produce the products that you uh, that you need for your subsistence. I agree with you. I agree with you totally. Is it? Uh, well, well, that's that's basically what I'm talking about. I agree with and, you, and uh, I'm saying that, and I'm saying that if we don't begin to do that, then we are condemning ourselves to eternal third classhood. Well, you're right, and you know, you talk about Ferguson. Ferguson, uh, those businesses was not black owned. You might have one or two. Or that I can I know of most of the business was foreigners, and those foreigners take those profits and send them back home. Yes. Just like the yes. uh, public service with the police, fire, city hall, public works, and school district, those people don't live in that community. So when they yeah. get paid, they go back where yeah. they come from. Yeah. So that community is being sucked dry of capital that should be floating around in that neighborhood. So but aren't they aren't they sixty five percent of the population? Are they sixty five percent of the population? I don't. I, I've been reading that. I don't know whether that's true or not. Well, let me put it like this: In the seventies, they came up with these what they call land reclamation plans. Basically, where they was moving, what they took areas that where blacks are, and this happened all around the country. In St. Louis, it was called a Team Four plan, and they cut services, they blighted, they redlined, and make it just so miserable that blacks moved out of those communities, and that's out of what those areas to, of the cities. That's what happens to a group of people and, who resolutely refuse, who resolutely refuse to organize a movement to promote and protect their interests. That's what happens to you. Well, I agree with you. But what you got there in Ferguson, you got young people who have moved, and they st- most of them stay in these what was townhouses. Now have been changed over to 
affectionating, so on and so on and so on. Not saying all, but a lot. And mm-hmm. these these young people do not have any connection as to civil uh, duty, should I say. Mm-hmm. And that's where it is. Now, they have to be organized. Can they be organized? Yes, but it hasn't been a certain effort to do that. And yeah. then you got the problem where even though you make up that percentage of the population, what through all uh, through a host of other reasons, you have been disfranchised when it comes to voting. So that there in itself is another problem. You can only be you can be disfranchised if you have a, if, if you like I said before. If you do not have an organized movement whose purpose is to promote and protect and defend your interests, those things happen to you. And see, and that's what we got to start. When I hear people say, "Well, black people ain't going to do that," okay, pay the consequences. Black people should do so and so. Well, you know black people are not going to do that. Okay, pay the consequences. That's all I'm saying. Now, if you well, don't yeah, do something, the there are consequences. They are, but, but there will be some. There will be some organization. But, you know, here's another point I wanted to make. Mm-hmm. This thing about white supremacy and racism. Now, we know racism today is nothing like what we what was called racism back in the day. Yeah. Uh, if you really want to know what racism is, read Henry, Henry Aaron's book, I Had a Hammer. And the things that happened to him as he was coming up. But this thing that we call white supremacy, white supremacy can be defeated. You can go up against it. And the way you do it is about competing against it, especially competing against it for the things it tries to control that you need in order to substantiate yourself. I agree. With I've you. seen it be de- de- I've seen it be defeated, and it's 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 just like it is grasping for its last breath today. I don't think it's. I think it's far from that. I don't think that. And I, I agree. One of the things I, where I, I, I see my position is that the reason that I don't get, you know, people. I know some people get. They feel very defeated. I say, I remember years ago a a brother who was an Algerian propagandist, and he, you know, he taught us a lot of stuff. And he told us, he said, one of the problems that you have in the black community is that you all expect to do something today and see results a month from now. He said, that's not going to happen. He said, you have to look upon it. You're caught up by a a big chain. And what every generation has got to do is to do its share to weaken the links in the chain. He said, maybe your great-grandchildren who will see the chain break, but the chain is going to break. But you've got to make sure you do your share to weaken the links. And ever since I heard that, man, I don't get all frustrated and Sitting by every little thing that go on, mm-hmm. I just make sure that we get. I encourage people. We got to do what we got to do to weaken the links. We ain't. It ain't gonna. See, I'm 76. I ain't gonna see it. But but nobody stays on top. Well, of me, and the people who've been running. Well, you know you're very. I'm sorry. You're very valuable in your 76. Yeah, I like to contact. I like to talk to you off off of public ears, and uh, okay. I give you my okay. email. Do you do email? I'll give you my email. I don't. I know how because, to uh, make sure you include a child. I I, uh, I went through those periods of time. I'm not as old as you are, but you know I can look and see you, see the back of you as you go on home. Close. You know what I came across? I came across a, a statement by credit, a, a quote credited to, to uh, Frederick Douglass, in which he said, "It is easier to build." Strong children than to repair broken men. Mm-hmm. Now I would change it to be yeah. broken adults rather than broken men. I would say broken adults, and I think that we have, to, as we move and begin to talk seriously about trying to organize, we have to understand that some people are lost. See, I think one of the mistakes we I remember back in the seventies and eighties, we would have trying to get young people to do things, and we might have let's say twenty youngsters, and we got. Fifteen who are open to some change, and five who just I don't. You know, we would do. We spend hours and hours and hours trying to get those five. Yeah. And my position now is that uh-uh, I ain't doing that no more. I'm, if if, right. if if you got fifteen and only three are ready, take the three and start working with them, and let the others know whenever y'all ready, you come on board. But if you think I'm gonna spend twenty hours and forty hours trying to plead with you, I ain't doing that. See when I say well, you're right, I agree with you. When I, say I see that all the time. When I say organize the movement, brother, here's an idea I have already. 
I probably should not put it on the air, but I'm going to. Okay. I'm trying to. I want. We, I, I got a little group here in D.C. We talk about trying to start something where we get fifty serious uh, black people, fifty people in fifty cities. That's two thousand five hundred people, and we can start doing something powerful. We get fifty people in fifty cities who are serious, and then we can pick a goal that we want to accomplish. You know, in the year. And we all be working the same way. 50 people. Well, you 50 know, here's a, and another point, too, uh, sir. Blacks have all the necessary skills and talents. Everything, brother. And qualifications within Everything. their population to, just to change their situation Everything. around right away. We, and it, we ain't got, it, it, we got, it, skills, it, we got the skills to do anything that we need to do to advance our interests in the society. We already have it. We just don't have it. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I really, and I believe this. I think there are more black people doing positive things around this country than we are aware of. But we're all in our own little enclaves, and we think we are the only ones. Right. But we needed some kind of, so we needed some kind of national hookup. So if these brothers and sisters are doing a good thing here in Georgia, we can make it known to people out there in in California, and they can say, wait a minute, I like that program. Maybe we can do that here and hook these two groups up. And somebody doing something good in Oregon, we can say, hey, wait a minute. You know, we need a national clearinghouse. Because mm-hmm. I think there are more people doing positive things than we think of, than we, than we really believe. I really believe that. It goes down to the there people. There are about. a whole lot of them. We just we so, so we're so What's your uh, email address now? AP. I'm not trying to take your your show in a different direction. <laughs> no, no, that's What's right. your email address? A Peter B at Verizon. A P A P E T E R. A Peter B is in Baker at Verizon dot mm-hmm. net. Okay. Well, I'm going to email you because I like to talk to you for one reason because you're older than I am. <laughs> and uh, you've seen some things I haven't seen, and people tell okay. me that too. So it must be good about it. And say, what's your name, host? Oh, this is Brother Ron. I know you've talked to my show before, uh, Brother Ron. All right. Yeah. Well, you have uh, you have a lot of knowledge too, young man. I really appreciate that. And you know something too. Uh, I don't know if I should call you Mr. Peters or what, but I'm very Peter. proud of the young people today. I'm very proud of what the what I see out of young people today for managing to do what they're doing in these you know in the Ferguson and so on and so on. You, I wouldn't have expected that, but they but they may not be guided, mm-hmm. but they sure you know it's something in the heart in the DNA of black folks that mm-hmm. every now and then it keeps rising back up, rising That's back. What I'm up. saying That's what I'm saying, man. That's why I say people should not get discouraged. We were every generation. We've always had a lot of us fall for the okie doke, but we've always had a, enough people who who don't fall for the okie doke to keep us going, and that's been going on ever since our ancestors were born here. I thought to say, I like right, to, Peter, it's true. Yeah, I thought to say too. I mean, I look at young people; they're like soldiers by generals. I look at the black middle class. I mean, I think about you know, like what's going on with Bill Cosby. Had he attacked the black middle class more than the black, you know, poverty and working class, he might have some backup. But I think the black middle class as a whole has neglected their duties. Because I even look at the early parts of the movement. You look at the Montgomery Bus Boycott movement, which lasted 381 straight days. It was successful because you had a black middle class as well as a black business class. You had, you had, working, you had the Pullman Porters, of course, E.D. Nixon, but you had a black middle class. I mean, I remember reading something with Dr. King was approached by S.B. Fuller, who was the richest black man at the time, and A.G. Gaston, who was the wealthiest black man in Alabama. They approached him because they said Montgomery wanted to sell their bus company. And Dr. King was suspicious of that. He said no, but if you fast forward to Memphis in his last speech, he was talking about becoming, you know, supporting black businesses and whatnot. If it wasn't for a tri-state bank in Memphis, then the Mississippi movement would have been to a standstill. Because what the White Citizen Council did back in the late 50s and early 60s, they would freeze loans to the black business folks in Mississippi. Because people don't understand that the Mississippi movement was ran by black entrepreneurs like Dr. T.R.M. Howard 
and MZ Moore, these folks that own businesses and gas stations and restaurants and whatnot, they was help running that movement through the regional council mm-hmm. Negro leadership, but the white citizen council wanted to shut them down. But it took a black bank working with the NACP to supply them loans to help them through that tough time. So it was the black middle class and black folks that actually created the foundation for the movement. But when we talk about the movement now, we think more about the black and white college students of Freedom Summer. Not about the black business class. And you know something class. too, Ron. You know mm-hmm. something, too, Ron, you're talking about the bus company. Now, blacks had the uh, safe bus company over in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Right, Dr. Clyde Anderson, yeah. Mm-hmm. He talked about that all Absolutely. the time. But, but even the Negro Leagues, they were making more money than the major leagues. You see, Jackie Robinson thing was, a, was a Trojan horse because the only team on the Negro Leagues outright by a white person was the Kansas City Monarch, uh, Ike Wilkinson. He had a relationship with, with Branch Ricky. Right. So that was a, that was a, that was a coup. Right. That was a coup right there. I'm gonna get ready to have to get ready to sign out, bro. Yes, sir, well, brother. Ben, it's an honor to have you on. Man. I'm glad you, you know, stick it with us. I know you had some issues earlier, but I'm glad you were able to come on and yeah, share yeah. your knowledge with our people. So, I, what's the best way to get a book from you? Like you say, you want your memoirs and you uh, got published. Send me, send me a. Uh, call me at this number. Okay. Two zero two seven one six four five six zero. Okay, I guess we will have that, and people can listen to it in the archives as well. I just want to thank you. you have any closing words you want to share with us or thoughts? No, I just want to say that uh, I, I'm glad the brother called, and I think that, as I said before, I think that they're more positive black folks. I'm, I, I, I got, I'm trying to put together something called Positive Black Folks in Action, where yeah. we try to we develop a clearinghouse so that people who are doing positive things can be made known to each other, because I think there are more of them out there than we, than we believe. Because all we hear about is that you know in in, in, the, in the mass media and, in, and even in some of our own media are the negative things. Right. But I think if we had a clearinghouse man where people who are doing something solid here can be made known to people, I think we, it would really be helpful. And I, I, I and I and the name I would like to give it is positive black folks in action. Positive black folks in action. And we've got a lot of positive people to be proud of. And I think that the lack of having a real media, like we actually had a race beat. Back in the day, you had like John right. Johnson and, and the Chicago defending and all that we, stuff. We need to we need to call a conference called the Positive Black Folks in Action Conference. And if you're not positive, we don't. Anybody who has to be persuaded and t- you 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 stay away from that meeting. Yeah. We want the true believers. And once we get everything struck, and then we start, and you can't, then we start reaching out to the people who you, you got to persuade. You can't have the first 10 or 15 minutes of the meeting talking about white people, what they're no. doing to you, neither. Right, you know what right. I, brother, brother, <laughs> brother, speaking about that, you know what I used to do when I used to speak? Mm-hmm. When I used to go to speak to black students in some of the campuses, you know what I would say to them? Mm. White people are no good. Now, I've said that. Now, let's talk about what we're going to do. <laughs> I like that. Yes. Thank you, brother. I, that, we that's, what that. mm. that's what I used to tell them. That's what I used to tell them. I'm not going to sit here and titillate you by white people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're going to talk about what we got to do. That's right. Okay. All right, brother. Thank you, Godspeed, and we love you manly in the words of great discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. And, Brother Pianchi, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Ryan. That was a really good time. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. I listened to y'all for about the last hour. I appreciate it, man. I saw you on the switch, but I just want to talk to you. I mean, I'm glad you called in because you're from the area. I just want to get your point of view. I heard about the Ferguson and St. Louis and your thoughts. I know you said you was proud of the young people. But I think young people are doing pretty well utilizing the social media, too. I mean, we just don't have a real oh, black yeah. media. We don't have a real black, quote-unquote, mainstream media outlet that really supports the things that Brother Bailey was talking yeah, about. We don't, have so, no, gotta, we don't have no businesses to support that. You know, media mm-hmm. need commercial dollars to survive. So until we have commercial dollars to support a media, and see, when you, when you like Claude Anderson says, and you know what mm-hmm. he said, you got to have businesses to control those five elements. And if right. you don't have viable businesses, it's not going to have. There have been examples. Maynard mm-hmm. Jackson in <clears throat> in Atlanta. Right. Uh, you've had uh, Jake uh, Jake Simmons out of Texas going back in the early uh, 1900s, 1920s with the Simmons Oil Company. He was a power broker. So mm-hmm. we have examples, but we just for some reason. Hey, uh, you forget Marion Barry too. I mean, Marion Barry. It is. 
Marion Barry. I mean, oh, he yeah. empowered a lot of black folks. I mean, he was like probably the best we ever had. I mean, that was, and that what people forget though. Like, you got to help people. You got to help create a base to support what you're doing. Like, you know what George Bush said some years ago? Uh, some people call y'all the rich. I call y'all my base. <laughs> you got to know who your base mm-hmm. is and who supports you and who you're supposed to support. That's what politics is all about. Yeah, it's about you supporting your people. Hub to fall back on. Exactly, and that's so and true. See, here's another point. We have to learn that people, we have to learn, you're dealing with human beings who's going to have human faults. So they're not going to mm-hmm. do everything right. You right. want to get to you want to get to them for what they have that you can utilize in order to fuel and me- mechanize what it is you're trying to do. Yes, sir. Definitely. I want you to hold on. I got a no. call. Yeah, I want to hold that thought because I want you to still be on. Got a caller from D.C. two hundred two. Welcome to We All Be. Yes. How are you, brother? Heard this is Randy Short. Oh, that be short. How you doing? Yeah, dealing with racial profiling at Thurgood Marshall Airport. But Marion Berry was an awesome man. I remember when I was 18 years old on my way to Africa, having won a citywide essay contest. Marion Berry stopped his business with the council and came down and hugged my parents and took a picture with us. I will always be thankful for that. Uh, he was always uh, he's a wonderful person. And we miss him. And they've uh, everyone who's come after him has betrayed our community. Uh, God bless him. And some of us will never let people uh, diminish his legacy. Uh, always, he will always be the only mayor we respect and love. I definitely, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think Marion Barry was a phenomenal man. I mean, as being a Mythian, he got missed his roots because he went to high school in Booker T. Washington. High school officer with Lamar on it. He's a guy who comes from sharecroppers. He never forgot where he came from. And I think that it's a lesson for every black person to learn, especially if you come high profile. Never forget your people. Never forget the folks left behind. And I think with the civil rights movement, one mistake that was made was that so many black folks were left behind. And now we still got this unfinished yeah. business 50 years later. And you know, I'll say this about Barry because I was doing an interview. It is a lie that Marion Barry was in any way corrupt or venal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marion Barry, I don't even think, had money for this funeral that's been done. Uh, Mm -hmm. He genuinely gave. He was a giver, no matter what they say about him. I I wish everybody were in the Vista Hotel. If that's what it took for someone to look out for the rank-and-file people, I would tolerate that over what we've got with all these uh, sellout black neck types. Who think not uh, looking for any, helping anyone else? Right. That's right. So you know, absolutely Marion, right. And I have to say this: Eric Holder, mm-hmm. they're going to spend three million dollars for body cams. Notice that. That's what they say. And yet, this same man in 1990 spent forty, forty-two, forty-four million dollars. That's in 1990s money to trap Marion Barry. Over forty million dollars. Mm-hmm people need to remember you can get a lot of folks to lie and set folks up when you put that kind of money out 40 over 40 million dollars that's what people remember that what what could i do to you or anybody else if i put 40 million dollars out there to catch you i mean i you can get me for 10 you can get me for 10 or 20 and so um I imagine you're going to solve the country's problems with police brutality with three million, and yet you used over forty million over twenty years ago to destroy the best um, black mayor that's ever existed in the history of this country. Wow, that's based off the man. members and one more Ruby Castro. Doctor, you say you're at the airport? Yes, I'm at. I'm on my way to Ferguson. Are you on your way to Ferguson? Well, this is Brother Pianchi. He's right in St. Louis. In the Ferguson area, maybe I could okay. connect. Well, well, give me my number because we're gonna. I need to tell you we're making a film. The tentative uh, title is uh, Dread Scott Nation. After Dred Scott Nation. When are you gonna air Monday? You supposed well, to air we're Monday? Not airing it. No, but we're gonna start filming. So, brother, bring us some. Are you gonna film Monday? Together. We're gonna start taking interviews on Monday. Maybe even Sunday. Are you gonna night. be with brother Yah? Uh, no, I'm going to be with uh, Harvey Shaw. Uh, yeah, but somebody's with, coming in town. I suppose the interview is some. What's your email address? Uh, it's W. Randy Short. W. Randy, R-A-N-D-Y-S-H-O-R-T? At Gmail. 
Okay. Uh, so I, well, I don't honest. know about any. I don't know about any interviews. I I will start scheduling them for maybe Sunday night, maybe Monday morning. But the folks are going to have to be vetted activists and folks that are truly working with the uh, with the movement. So bring bring legitimate people, uh, and and we'll happily talk to them. Uh, I'll just put it out there like that because it's, yeah. I, I've seen some pimps in this uh, Ferguson mm-hmm. thing. You know, we are, we have Jesse Jack off already and Reverend Crapton and these other folks who've been around deceiving people. Uh, and I can't, I'm not going to waste any video building up some black neck that's going to stab our people in the back. Mm. Believe that. Well, you know, uh, you, you're absolutely right. Like I said before, I'm happy to see what they're young. But there's a lot of action going on behind the scenes with uh, people that's prominent and it's making things happen that you don't see. Uh, yeah, I some talked of the to young Reverend, people. C. T., Reverend C.T. Vivian today. We hadn't talked oh. in several months because I told, him, told Reverend Vivian in August this was the movement. This was the movement being reborn. And uh, he didn't see it. They see it now. So there are people moving on. I mean, even folk in their 90s that are beginning to get behind this. Uh, yeah, it's, on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. It's on. I did yeah, so you? If you're from St. Saint- Louis, uh, we got a lot of love for y'all. Y'all literally single-handedly saved the whole nation. A bunch of kids. I mean, it's incredible. God bless yeah. you. Um, I'm just can't well, wait to get there. Yeah. You never know why and when something is going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the way that's the way ancestors work. You never know when, why. Some people open their mouth and words come out and they never thought about saying those things. Well, right. I'm going to give so, you an example. Back in March, the same man that interviewed me when I was talking about being profiled at U.S. Air at the mm-hmm. desk, uh, I told him in March that our people would rise up on on the anniversary of Watts. The ancestors told me this. this is, that's, that's what I told them. What I said, the ancestors want me to tell you. And sure enough, I said, I can't tell you where, but mm-hmm. I can tell you when. And surely it, it happened. And Missouri is so central to the whole narrative. Dred Scott, the Gaines case, Shelley versus Kramer, um, the Ferguson case, uh, Bleeding Kansas, Mm-hmm. Um, the Missouri Compromise. I mean, Lord, I mean, the Delaney case. I mean, yeah, I mean, you remember in the 60s, they came out with a new dance every week. Missouri comes out with a new precedent in terms of either pushback or repression that's challenged uh, every generation. I mean, Pruitt, I go, I mean, yeah, yeah. First and then Lord school. Gaines, too. Right. Lord Gaines with the law school. Lord Gaines, too, in the University of Missouri. Well, I said the Gaines, I said the Gaines yeah. case. Yeah, and the they, murdered, they murdered him, made him disappear. Right. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, 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 on, on the cusp of, 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 of everything. So a lot of people sleep on Missouri. And one of the things that they really sleep on, when they criminalize a young black man in Missouri and ignore that Missouri is crystal meth central for the country, they've got more, in fact, they're more crazy checks. I was doing my research. Jefferson County. All these crazy checks for these uh, folks. You're going to Jefferson County. Uh, <laughs> Jefferson County. Yeah, I'm going to talk about them. All those veterans yeah. out there, you don't see them shooting them. You, they don't have to say, hands up, don't shoot. They get uh, <laughs> drug courts, and they get all sorts of help to come back into society. They've killed more firemen and policemen with their fires than anybody in St. Louis, and yet they're not facing mass incarceration. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, you know. Um, yeah. That's where a lot of your cops are coming from this, in these municipalities, too. Ryan, what's your email address? Uh, it's uh, Mr. M. Giga. We all be at gmail.com. Like, we all be one word. We all, all be. B. The letter yeah. B? A B and B E at gmail.com. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I thought I was going to say Henry yeah, Hampton. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Brother Bianchi. I was saying I got to run. Well, uh, we should call I'm email call you. You make man. sure you email me when your shows are coming on. That's because a lot of, I, you know, I want to be on, listen to some more of your shows because uh, you don't have too many uh, black BTR station that's talking about moving forward. They they talk about some furious things. I appreciate but, that. I'll uh, definitely put on my email list. 
So be on. I I also want to help you on as a guest as well too. I look forward to helping you on in the very near future. All right then. Well, I'm gonna come here, man. I gotta run over my grandson, so I'll talk to you later. Yes, sir. Take care. Be safe. And uh, Dr. Yeah, peace. Dr. Charles was gonna say that Henry Hamilton, the guy who created the eyes of the prize, he's he's from St. Louis as well too. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, really? Missouri. Yeah, you know, his father was the director of the Homer G. Phillips Hospital for years. He was the chief surgeon, and he wanted his son to be a mm-hmm. surgeon, but he went down to Selma, I believe, and he had like a come to Jesus moment mm-hmm. when he went to Selma. So he decided to try to document the movement. That's how the eyes on the prize was born. He went down to Selma and got the thing. Because <clears throat> you 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 know that, um, that there's some more that I was just gonna put out there that's just mind blowing. Uh, well, we're going to talk about organics and ecology. You know, we got Carter, not Carter, yep. no, George Washington Carver coming yeah, right. out of there. Uh, you, um, you have the only black city bank in uh, Jefferson City. Uh, uh, people forget Langston. Langston Hughes is from down there. Right, exactly. I mean, every time you turn around, there's something coming up out of there. So you yeah, can't sleep on Missouri. The first black high school west of the Mississippi was built. There was some of the high school in St. Louis. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, it's a lot of mm. incredible folks come out of some of the high school in St. Louis. Uh, that's the first black high school west mm. of the Mississippi River. So, St. Louis is, well, I mean, Charles I, Chuck Berry's from Summer High School. He went to Summer. Chuck Berry went to Summer High School. Mm. Yeah, I know he's from there. And I'm thinking, what about uh, our sister there? The one that. Um, why am I forgetting her name? And I should know it. Uh, Josephine Baker. Yeah, yeah Josephine Baker. I think you'll say Maxine Thanks. Waters because she's from St. Louis too, Maxine Waters. No, no. So it was Josephine Baker, yes. Mm-hmm. And so a lot has come out of there. And, you know, I just claim East St. Louis. I mean, so you got Miles <laughs> Davis. Of course, Jefferson. you can't go wrong. That's right. You, you can't know. go wrong there. And Eugene Redmond still, he's holding it down. The famous poet. Mm. Eugene Redmond. The well, he went to though. Harvard, right? Who that? Disney Jazz, Redmond, Eugene Redmond, the the poet. Yeah, didn't he? Is he? Okay, no, that's a poet. I'm thinking about another Redmond. Okay, okay. You know, there's so much, so much through there, and uh, the thing that was also blowing my mind about the fact that um, uh, St. Louis was the the provisioning place for blacks going west, the Exodus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was one of the few places that they could go, and also, you know, you know, Missouri was a pioneer state uh, in um, in doing expulsions, ethnically cleansing, killing, burning, driving home black communities out of places like areas like the Ozarks. Mm-hmm. It's a first. I mean, it's a pretty intense place uh, if you think about the uh, Easter parade through uh, burning black men. In I think 1901, I mean, yeah. that's a big expulsion from uh, Springfield. I always think about Springfield. Uh, the people are crazy out there, but, you know, um, <laughs> it's just real. It's just incredible mm-hmm. that people have stood up. I was up all night reading about Dred Scott and oh, that's powerful, how man. hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, they just kept going back to court. I mean, he's in court more than Thurgood Marshall. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know if they could read or write, but, you know, they were bad. I mean, the only thing that they didn't do was say, you know, screw these people. We're just going to Canada. They were right, right. in Montana, I mean, or, or I'm sorry, um, Minnesota. They could have just split. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyway, let me see. I'm about to get on the plane. And I'm probably going to get profiled again. No, don't say that. Yeah, well, I want to thank you for calling in. Really? Hey, well, you, 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 you. I mean, I, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. I just want to wish you stay traveled at a very productive trip in Ferguson. Is that is that your first time going to Ferguson? It's the first time, but I want you to interview my sister, who's the the, the woman you always see on press TV. She's the one that's been getting out all these stories on our people. I would love to give me your contact information. Yeah, I would love to interview her. If she's available this weekend, I'll, I'll love to interview her if possible or whenever. Let me let you go, brother. All right, Dr. Short, All take right. care, man. God bless. All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.
And that's does it for this edition of We All Be Radio. It's very productive edition of We All Be Radio. I was your host, Brother Ron, R2C2H2. You can catch us in the archives. And I have some more shows coming up later on very soon. But I just want to thank everybody for listening and hanging in. Uh, check us out on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is We All Be TV, one word. That's We All Be. That's W E A L L B E T V. So you got We All Be TV. That's YouTube.com backslash We All Be TV. And until next time, family, take care. Keep producing and pushing. And remember, we love you all madly.